me, okay? Woo! Yeah! All right, um, thanks so much for coming to our talk on social sector and open source. My name is Mala, and I'm a program manager here at GitHub. Um, I work under Admis on the social impact team, and I lead a program called Open Source for Good. The broad remit of Open Source for Good is how can we ensure the open source ecosystem betters the world? So, you know, kind of a small goal, but it's fine. <laughs> Um, in that lofty moonshot goal, obviously we have a lot of ways that we can approach the question. Um, I joined GitHub in April of this year, so April 2019. And prior to joining GitHub, I spent about a decade working at the United Nations and other international development organizations designing and building core digital products for different stakeholders. So it was my job to go to different countries to understand their needs and to build whichever product that they needed. Obviously, at GitHub, we have a different approach to technology. So while we don't, it's not our job to go out and build the individual tools that comprise the open source ecosystem, we build the software that hosts the majority of the open source ecosystem. And so when we, when we think about this question, how can we ensure the open source ecosystem betters the world, our approach has really morphed into this question. How can we help social sector organizations engage with open source to better the world? So that means how can we look at the organizations that do the core work, the core social justice work, to advance and promote social justice causes and help them use open source to better what they do? And that could be anything from building better programs. It could be you know, increasing operational efficiency. Ignore that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, or it could be to build internal technical capacity. So we're really working with the social sector organizations in order so they can work better. Now, on the social impact team, we're a mighty team of three, um, but between the three of us, among the three of us, we have many decades of experience of social sector work, whether it's a huge multinational organization like the UN or smaller domestic nonprofits, really we run the entire gamut. And more than that, we have a lot of capacity. We have a great network. And so if we have a knowledge gap in the social sector, we know who to call, we know who to ask, and we know how to fill those gaps. So it's safe to say that we know a lot about the social sector. And then on the other front, GitHub, we know about open source. It's kind of our thing. I don't know if you noticed that theme, but we know about open source. But what we know less about is this intersection. How does the social sector actually interact with open source? What can we actually do to improve that ecosystem, that intersection therein? Now, instead of taking some kind of one-off guesses and just supposing that we know the answer to that, as social scientists, we decided to take a more systematic approach. And so when we think about, mission, when we think about what that interaction could look like, there's a lot of different ways that it could play out. We could look at the mission or the vision, or we could look at the thematic, the mandated area of the organization. We could look at the geography. Where is the organization actually based? Do they have a headquarters in one country? Do they work abroad in others? Do they have federated organizations across one country? Are they concentrated on one local area? There's a lot of different geographies at play. What about language? The majority of the open source ecosystem is hosted in English. Documentation is mostly in English. So what happens if we're working in Francophone West Africa or in Spanish or Portuguese speaking Latin America? We could also look at the organizational structure. There's many different structures and in a minute you'll hear more about that. Many different organizational structures that comprise the social sector. There's tax statuses like nonprofit and then there's organizations that are for profit that do really wonderful work but they don't have that tax status organizations that have board of advisors and organizations that have one person or 10,000 people. And then another theme you'll hear about a lot today is funding models. Do these organizations get their money from US governments through USAID or DFID? Do they get money from individual donors contributing? Or do they get money from grants from foundations? So again, looking at that many complicated set of questions, instead of just making guesses of what we think that intersection would look like, we decided to take a systematic approach by doing a research project. We love research. Um, so our research project is asking one critical question, which is how or what are the challenges and opportunities of the social sector in engaging with open source, either as producers or consumers or just really fun bystanders? One of the important questions therein that's pertinent to this audience what are the challenges and opportunities that the social sector has in producing open source software? And so to take you through some of those insights, you know, we're, we've got a lot of data, um, we've done a ton of evidence ga gathering both 
qualitative and quantitative, but to take you through some of the insights that we do have before we do the final synthesis. It's my pleasure to introduce you Gina Asaf, who is an independent consultant and researcher for the social sector. Am I on? Hello, can you hear me? Good, thank you Mala for the introduction. And I just wanna you know, let you all know that I'm, I have a little bit of a cough, so if I go into a coughing fit, excuse me. I did take some cough suppressants, so I should be good. Um, I'm Gina Asaf, and I'm a technology designer and researcher uh, with a software development background. I worked in the private tech sector for several years, but more recently, for the past four to five years, I've been a technology designer for the global development and international um, aid uh, space. And I was brought on by the Case Foundation and GitHub to help lead this research project, which Mala you know, talked to you a little bit about, which is we're trying to understand what are the barriers, the challenges, uh, the successes in open source in the social sector. And I'm happy to share today a little bit about uh, what we've been working on the past few months on, in this research. On to the next slide. Oh, do we have a clicker? So our approach to this project is rooted in a human-centered, user-centered design approach, which means we're putting the users, the stakeholders, center, and we're trying to understand their engagement with technology in the social sector. Um, and so we bucketed um, the users into three or four types of users. We have producers, so developers of software, and, and you can be any part of the development process, um, um, a developer, product manager, a designer, or a consumer of software. So you're, you know, you use software, you use it for your purposes for your social sector, or a funder of technology. And of course, there's overlap between these roles. If you're a producer of technology and open source software, you're most likely going to be a consumer of technology and open source software. But we try to bucket and target the users in our research based on where we saw more potential to engage further with open source software. And then we looked at different levels of engagement when we were targeting individuals. So high engagement with open source software to low or non-existent um, engagement with open source software. And to understand these users, their motivations, their challenges, and their successes, we conducted a combination of quantitative analysis with a widely disseminated survey. And then we also did qualitative research with semi-structured interviews. And we've conducted about 30 interviews so far. And as we were mapping, um, as, we're, as we're doing a scoping on this space, we noted individuals and organizations working in the social sector space, looking, you know, working domestically and globally. And we noted differences between organizations that are implementers of projects versus funders. And of course, there's organizations that do both. They implement projects and they fund uh, uh, projects. And as you can imagine, this space is huge and there's a lot of actors in this space. And we focused on areas that we thought would give us a diverse set of inputs and also would, would align with the priorities of, of the Case Foundation and GitHub. Um, and so, um, you know, we targeted individuals from these different organizations, and the ones that we have here are the ones that we, we, we focused on. So we talked to um, NGOs um, and nonprofits uh, domestically and internationally, such as YMCA and internationally like Mercy Corps, and then looked at uh, foundations such as the Gates Foundation and the Ford Foundation, and then we also talked to uh, multinational organizations such as the UN and the World Bank, and then we also talked to tech consultants, and these are individuals who are either working internally within the organizations or they're independently and they work across multiple organizations within the social sector. And we targeted these individuals um, from the producer and the funder and the developer side in our research. And as we also were mapping out the roles within these social sector organizations, we try to understand you know, where you are when it comes to decision-making power and your understanding of technology and open source software. And we noted an imbalance here. So we have people making decisions on technology and on you know, potentially using open source, um, but their knowledge of, you know, they have high, high power in the decision-making process, but their knowledge of technology more broadly and then open source software more specifically was very, you know, was very limited. 
Um, and so, for example, you have program implementers. Those are the, they're experts in their field of the social sector programming, such as youth. You know, they're looking at youth issues or agriculture or nutrition or education, or like they're executives running these nonprofits, but then they're limited in their knowledge of technology. Um, and so, you know, other than this insight that we kind of like gleaned when we were like scoping out the, the roles and the, and the uh, organizations in this sector, from our research, we, we want to, you know, we're, we're still in the process, as Mala mentioned, of analyzing our, our notes and, and doing full synthesis. But we wanted to share a few early insights from our research. Um, and we focus on the production side of open source software here, what we're sharing with you all. Um, and, and, you know, but we'll have a full report early 2020 with all the findings and the research. And I want to emphasize this is early insights that we have from this research. The first insight uh, that we noted was, um, you know, in, in these organizations, when they're looking at technology and, and they're assessing their needs, they're going to bring in sometimes these consultants that are working internally or externally, and they're going to assess what's out there, what's available. If, if there's nothing out there that meets their needs exactly, this is when they look at custom built software. And in the case is when they are going to build custom built software and, and, and to scale, what's important to these organizations is to do it in a sustainable and affordable way. And we found some successful examples where open source was a very viable solution and, and, and a success domestically and globally. Second insight was that there are open source projects that are developed by the social sector. And there are some successful ones. However, the majority of them, and this is an issue, is that the social sector organization, the in developers, individuals working in this sector will download, fork the code, use it for their own individual use case, update it, but then they will not contribute it back to the main source code to, con to benefit the wider sector. And we see this as a missed opportunity in cross-organizational collaboration in technology that could benefit you know, very important social sector use cases. The third insight um, that we want to share was more on the challenge side. So there are some individuals and organizations that are believers in the open source movement, and they've built open source projects, and they even have developers that are interested in contributing. However, the challenge that they're facing is in the, managing these developers. These organizations are strapped for money and time and budget, and so bringing on developers, training them on the code base, um, and, and, and managing the community of developers is just beyond their, what they have available in terms of times and resource. And, and you know, they, even though they saw the clear value in the open source and they had developers ready, readily available, they were not able to leverage them. And so these are a few of our early insights. We, we, you know, we're going to have a lot more, a lot of findings and more, more research that we're going to share in our report early 2020. So stay tuned for that. And I'm going to hand it back to Mala, who's going to share some examples related to these insights. Thank you. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gina, for those really wonderful insights. Um, you know, it's one of the really wonderful things about doing this research is that we've had the opportunity to connect with so many inspiring organizations working at this intersection of social sector and open source. And when I think about an organization or even a person that's really used open source to catalyze change from within the organization to really kind of hone in on the approach that we're hoping to take, um, it's Andrew Pham, who is the co-founder co and head of product at Hikaya. Um, you saw Hikaya's logo earlier um, in the announcement of GitHub sponsors. So as Gina mentioned, a lot of times tech consultants will be brought into different social sector organizations to do a long consultation process, and I do mean long. In the social sector, every budget has to be, every dollar of every budget really has to be accounted for. And so you're not allowed to just buy licenses or procure things without really justifying those costs. So as a result, these consultants come in, they have to do a long vetting process and really come up with a reasoning as to why they want to go with this tool versus that tool. And Andrew was exactly one of those consultants. In 2013, he was deployed to the Afghanistan country office of a major international global humanitarian organization. And he spent one year going through every single indicator tracking software on Earth, really. After that full year, they found one tool that kind of worked. They piloted it, and it turned out it didn't actually work. Um, it didn't really meet the needs of their use cases. They didn't have the access and the permissions that they needed. But thankfully, 
Andrew and a few of his colleagues decided in parallel that they were going to try to build their own solution using GitHub and open source. Within four to six months, remember the consultation process took a full year, but within six months they had piloted a full coded prototype of their tool, which they called Tola Activity. And within a few years, they'd been able to scale Tola to 40 different countries. Andrew, unfortunately, could not be here today. He's uh, otherwise engaged on a, a work retreat in Mombasa, Kenya, but he sends this picture of he and his team. So they're hanging out on the beach. And uh, Andrew, if you're, if you're there, hi. <laughs> um, one of the things that Andrew and I spoke about a lot is the idea that in the social sector, we have communities of best practices for everything, everything. We have communities of best practices for understanding the local context and building cultural competencies. We have uh, frameworks and best practices for designing projects, designing indicators, and even as of late, collecting and storing data. But somehow, even though the methodologies are known, we don't necessarily use best practices when it comes to software development, so collaborative, iterative design. And it's, it's understandable the way, because of Hunting Works, why that actually happens. Often, money will be allocated at an HQ, which usually is in a major city in the United States or in Canada or in Europe. It'll then trickle down to a regional bureau, perhaps the East Africa Regional Bureau or the South Asia Regional Bureau, or it'll go through a sectoral budget. So if you work in the public health team or the education team or the nutrition team, then it'll go to the country office, and then finally it'll go down to the project level. And so there's very little collaboration among the projects at the lowest level and every budget has to be allocated individually, so you don't have that collaborative process at all. And what Andrew was able to do using Tola Activity and open source and GitHub was to reverse that entire cycle on its head. They took project level data and they were able to feed it up into the country level at the Afghanistan country office and then laterally scale that across 40 different countries. As Andrew said, building an open source solution offered a level of transparency our leadership didn't know existed. We went from managing with Gantt charts to seeing individual bugs for each country. And for those of you who have ever worked internationally, I think you can understand this transformative effect. Imagine getting one or two country reports every year, some high-level insults, but insights, but you have no idea really what's going on in the field. And then going from that situation to where you can go and troubleshoot bugs on a daily basis. You can go and tap into the Afghanistan country office or the Kenya country office and then see these are the agricultural outputs from one project that we had helping farmers. Imagine being able to collaborate or analyze that over time or within the country or within the region or among different countries. It doesn't just change the way you build software. It changes the way that you program, you design things. It changes the way that you talk about your work and you look at how to do your work in the future. It's huge. Of course, Andrew's had many wonderful, amazing successes with open source, but of course, we still have a long way to go. And so I asked him, what's one wish you have for open source in the social sector? And speaking to the insight that Gina shared earlier, it's simply that the social sector doesn't merge back their code. There, even though it is a fairly niche industry within open source, there is a kind of a culture, if you will, that we fork the code code it up for our one case study, and then we never contribute anything back. And part of it is because we don't have the education tools for the social sector to have really good, in-depth conversations about when you fork or when you put it onto a different branch, the merits of actually contributing back. And part of it is because we have sustainability issues in the so social sector when it comes to open source. And so his wish for the social sector and open source is really to create that interconnected community, that collaborative approach and for us to think more critically about how we can contribute back to what we actually build. Um, you know, one of the things that I can say from my own experience working at the UN and in the social sector for a long time is just the gratification that you get for working on some of the world's most challenging problems. Whether you're helping victims of a natural disaster or you're bettering a public health system or you're helping with gender inequality and reducing gender and domestic violence. Um, and when I think about that intersection of just using open source to really better the world, one of the people that always comes to my mind is Hera Hussein, who is the founder of an organization called Chain. Um, Hera hails from Pakistan. Um, she, unfortunately, like Andrew, could not be with us today, but she also sends a warm hello from her home in London. Um, Hera, about seven years ago, found herself in a very complicated situation. 
As she told me, she unfortunately found herself having to help two friends escape abusive relationships. And in that process, she was just shocked at how little accurate information there was online to help women in similar situations. Hera was a huge open source advocate in other realms of her life, through school and through work, through volunteer efforts. And so when she decided to build a solution, she knew that the solution had to start with open source. One of the things that Hera and I spoke about a lot is her efforts in building a community. Um, we've seen it through the research. I think intuitively we all know it at some level, and Hera confirmed that you know, in open source generally, a lot of the projects, the genesis of the project is around a common tech need. And so you find the community through the forums that care about that tech need. It makes sense, and it also makes building a community relatively straightforward. Go to the forums where those technologies exist, come to GitHub Universe and find them, be passionate about that tech challenge, and start a project through that. But in, the open, in open source for the social sector, more often than not, the open source community is built around this common social cause. And so the people who really care about that cause, they may not be at Universe, they may not be in these conferences. And so how you market and build that community is not nearly as straightforward. You have to go to where those people who care about that cause is. Even if they're not open source advocates, even if they don't know about open source, they might eventually contribute back to your project. And that's exactly what Hera did. She's, she's great. She's spoken all over the world about Chain's work. And it worked. In six years, she's built a community of over 400 developers, the majority of whom themselves are um, victims of abusive relationships and are representative of intersectional communities. So intersectional communities designing for other intersectional communities. Since six years ago when the website launched, her guides and Chan's guides have been viewed by 360,000 unique visitors, and they're available in eight languages. Not only are they available in those eight languages, they're context specific. So if I go online and I try to find a guide in Italian or in Urdu, then I'm not only finding a guide written in that language, I'm finding something that's written for Italian law or Pakistani law. Um, <clears throat> she's got guides on all kinds of different aspects of abuse, and um, we're really excited, actually, two of our two developers from Che and Tiffany and Satvika here in the front row. Um, are here and they're going to be demoing in just a couple of hours a new digital product that Chan re recently launched called Soul Medicine, which helps women navigate through mental health issues. If you're interested, please do stop by at the Connect space from 1.15 to 3.20 today. Talk to them, hear more about Soul Medicine, and figure out how you can get involved. Um, so I had the chance to ask Hera the same question I, that I asked Andrew. What is one wish you have for open source in the social sector? And she said, quite frankly, I just need a better way to manage the, the great network that I've created. Um, earlier, I, you heard me say, you know, a lot of open source projects generally con consolidate, come through with one tech need. And although it doesn't happen always, there is definitely in cases, quite a few cases, in which private companies, private tech companies, find a vested interest in that tech need and give institutional funding, or are even able to hire people who work on that project to, to dedicate full paid time to that work. Conversely, in the social sector, we never see that. It is extremely rare. Even if the cause is near and dear to a major organization, very, very rarely do we see any kind of institutional support given to open source projects that address that need. And so people like Hera are limited by the fact that she has to work on this part-time. She has a full-time job, and she has to manage all of this network on the side. And so her wish for the open source in the social sector is really to look at the private sector models and figure out a more sustainable way to grow that network and become sustainable. Well, speaking of funding, um, we, since May, we've been working with uh, the Case Foundation on this great research project. And it's my pleasure to now introduce you to John Jones, who is the VP of Interactive Strategies at the Case Foundation, to give their perspective. Thanks so much, Mala. As Mala said, I'm John Jones. I'm VP of Interactive Strategies at the Case Foundation. Case Foundation is uh, the family foundation of digital pioneers Gene and Steve Case. And it is our mission to invest in people and ideas that can change the world. So we're extremely excited to be partnering on this project with GitHub because we think open source and unleashing it for the social sector is one of those world-changing ideas. In fact, we think open source is a form of philanthropy, an limitless form of philanthropy, in fact. 
One gift of open source code to a community can benefit a multitude of organizations attacking a similar problem, working on a similar mission. Organization after organization can benefit from that gift of code to better do their work. And the value of that contribution only grows as more people give back to open source projects in all the many ways you can participate in these projects. We see this as a hugely powerful resource for groups like nonprofits and NGOs and those trying to change the world. And so with this research, we are hoping to unlock that philanthropic potential and help deploy it to the sector. So some of the ways we see ourselves doing that is first, looking at how can we better inform product offerings for the social sector? What do they need to better find open source projects, to better use them and better share them and participate in that active digital philanthropy themselves? How do we produce educational materials for the social sector? Through this research, we hope to understand where are the knowledge gaps? Where do people need to be educated on what open source is and how you participate it in, as Mala and Gene explained? and then deploy those educational materials to the social sector to onboard them to this great ecosystem. And then lastly, we hope to work with our peer foundations and other funders to help them understand this, the power of this digital philanthropy and also show them how funding of sustainable open source projects can benefit entire sectors and again, help change the world. We're very excited to be part of this research project and we're very excited to share it with you in early 2020 and put the findings to work to create some real change. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Mala. Thanks so much, John. Um, earlier today in the keynote, you heard um, GitHub really is thinking about funding. It's a, it's a huge challenge, and it's part of the core sustainability issues of open source. And I'm very excited to announce on behalf of the social impact team that GitHub sponsors also includes the social sector. Both of the organizations you heard before, Hikaya, hello? Um, Hikaya and Chayan are part of the first cohort of organizations that will be available through GitHub sponsors. So we highly encourage you to check out their pages and consider supporting however you can. If you want to get involved in the research, which is ongoing until early 2020, if you want to get involved in Open Source for Good more broadly, we have a few other projects that we'd love to have your expertise working on. Or if you want to get involved just generally with GitHub and the social impact team, please come find me and my two colleagues. Admin's here in the front, and then Toya's out in the Connect space running a micro um, mentoring session right now. We're here on site today and tomorrow, and we would love to work with you. So thank you so much for listening, and please come find us. Thank you.